Hello and welcome to theCUBE's coverage of DockerCon 2021. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE, Adrian Ionel, CEO and co-founder and chairman of Morantis CUBE alumni. Adrian, great to see you. Thanks for coming on theCUBE here for DockerCon coverage. Good to see you. Hey John, uh, nice to see you again too. So obviously open source innovation continues. You guys are at the forefront of it. Uh, great to see you. What's new with Morantis? Give us the update on what's happening. Well, uh, I mean, uh, what's what's interesting is we've had one of the uh, best years ever uh, last year, and this very much continues you know, into this year. It's uh, pretty fantastic. Um, we've won about 160 new customers. Kubernetes is definitely on a tear. We see customers doing bigger and bigger and more exciting things, which is absolutely uh, great to see. Lens uh, is uh, getting tremendous traction. I think we have a five-fold increase in user base within a year. Uh, so it's a lot of fun right now out there. Uh, customers are definitely pushing the boundaries of what Kubernetes can do, and they want to get the cloud native infrastructure, and they want to get there faster, and they want to do big and exciting things, and we are so happy to be a part of the, uh, of the ride with them. You guys are investing in brand new open source solutions for customers. Uh, give us an update on on why and why do they matter for your company? Yeah. Well, there are. Uh, let me unpack this a little bit. And there are really two elements to this. One is why open source and what's new, what what matters. So, I think open source is not new, but open source is being embraced more and more heavily by uh, by companies everywhere because it's just a very flexible and cost efficient and highly innovative way. To, um, to use innovation and to, to consume new software. And a lot of innovation these days is happening in the open source communities, which is why it's uh, super exciting for many, many users. Now, what's new with us? I think there are two uh, really uh, terrific things that we brought to market that we see get a lot of interest and attention from our customers and they create value. One is this uh, idea of delivering a cloud native infrastructure that's Kubernetes based as a service for some of the largest use cases out there for very large enterprises who want to have a cloud experience on-prem just like they have it in public clouds. That is absolutely uh, fantastic and that's new and, and different and very, very exciting for customers. The second thing that's new and compelling and exciting is the um, is Lens, which is this Kubernetes uh, IDE that has empowered in the meantime close to 180,000 Kubernetes developers around the world to make it much, much easier to take advantage of Kubernetes. So you can think of it as a IDE and a debugger for anybody who is using Kubernetes uh, on public clouds or on, on private infrastructure. Um, that is getting tremendous traction and adoption. The interest in Kubernetes has been unbelievable. I mean, in KubeCon, we saw Kubernetes almost become boring in the sense of like, it's, everyone's using it and there's still now, it's enabling a lot more cloud native development. Why no. does that lens matter? What is the benefit? Because that's, that's a killer opportunity because Kubernetes is actively being adopted. The general consensus is it's delivering the value. Yeah, so let me unpack this in two aspects. Why, why is Kubernetes important? why people adopting it and then how is Lens adding value on top of it for people who want to use Kubernetes. Kubernetes is tremendously important is because it solves some very, very fundamental problems for developers and operators when building cloud native applications. These are problems that are very essential to actually operating in production, but are really unpleasant for people to solve like availability, scalability, uh, reusability of services, so all of that with Kubernetes comes right out of the box and developers no longer have to worry about it. And at the same time, Kubernetes gives you a standard where you can build apps on public clouds and then move them on prem or build them on prem, move them on public clouds and anywhere in between. So it gives you kind of this universal cloud native standard that you as a developer can rely on. And that's extremely valuable for developers. We all remember from the Java times when Java came online, you know, people really valued this idea of right once, run anywhere. And that's exactly what Kubernetes does for you in the cloud native world. So it's extremely, extremely valuable for people. Um, now, how does Lens add value in this context is also very exciting. 
So what's happening when you now build these applications on top of Kubernetes is that you have many, many services which interact with each other in fairly complex and sometimes unpredictable ways. And they also very much interact with the infrastructure. So you have, you can, you can imagine kind of this jungle, this uh, Lego um, building of many different cloud native services working together to build your app or to run your app. Well, how are you going to navigate that and debug that as a developer as you build and optimize your code? So what Lens does is it gives you kind of like a real time cockpit or console. console. You can imagine like you're a fighter pilot in this jet and you have all these instruments kind of coming at you and it gives you like this fantastic real time situational awareness. So you can very quickly figure out what is it that you need to do either fix a bug in your application or optimize the performance of your code or make it more reliable, fix security issues. And it makes it extremely easy for developers to use, right? So Kubernetes tradition has been hard to use, complicated. This makes it super fast, easy, and a lot of fun. You know, that is really the great theme about this conference this year. And your point exactly is developer experience, making it simpler and easier, okay, and innovative is really hits the mark on productivity. I mean, and that's really been a key part. So I think that's why I think people are so excited about the Kubernetes because it's not like some other technologies that had all the setup requirement and making things easier to get stood up and managed. It's huge. So congratulations, great point, great call out there. Great insight. Uh, the, the next question I want to ask you is you guys have coined the term software factory. Um, yeah, and this kind of plays into because if you have all the services, you can roll them up together with Lens and those tools, it's going to be easier, more productive. So that means there's more software. Obviously open source is a software factory too. Um, what does that term mean? Um, and, and how well, can we leverage it? Yeah, yeah, so here's what it means to us and here's how we arrived at it. So uh, as you know, today, software is being produced by two groups working together to build software. Uh, certainly the core people are the developers. These are the people who create the core functionality, imagine how the software should be architected and ultimately ship the code, right? And maintain the code. But the developers today don't uh, operate just by themselves. They have uh, their sidekicks, they have their friends, both often platform engineering and platform engineers. These are the people who are helping developers you know, make some of the most important choices as to which platforms they should use, which services they should use, how they should think about governance, how should they think about cloud infrastructure they should use, which open source libraries they should use, how often they should refresh those libraries and support. So these platform engineers create, if you want, the factory, the substrate, and the automation, which allows these developers to be highly productive. And the analogy one could make is the chip design, right? If you imagine chip design today, you take advantage of a lot of software, a lot of tooling, a lot of prepackaged libraries to get your job done. You're not doing it you know, by yourself, um, uh, just wiring transistors uh, together or, or, or logical elements. You do it using a massive amount of automation and software libraries and tools. So that's, that's what we aim to provide to, you, uh, to to customers because what we discovered is that customers don't want to be in the business of building these software factories. They don't want to be in the business of building platform engineering teams if they can avoid it. They just do it because they have no choice, but it's difficult for them to do, it's cumbersome, it's expensive, it's a one-off and really doesn't create any unique business value because the platform engineering for a bank is very similar to the platform engineering for let's say an oil and gas company or an insurance company. Um, so we do it for them turnkey as a service so they can be focusing on what matters most to them. That's a great insight. I love that platform engineering enabling software developers. Cause you know, look at SaaS, throwing features together, having a feature developer is cool. And, and, and the old days of platform was the full stack developer. Now you have this notion of platform as a service I, in a way, in this kind of new way. What's different, Adrian? You've, you've seen these waves of innovation, certainly on open source side. We've been covering your career for, for over a decade uh, with Marantis and, and OpenStack and others. This idea of a platform that enables software, what's changed now about this new substrate you mentioned? What's different than the old platform model? 
Uh, that, that's a wonderful question. Um, uh, I, uh, there are a couple of things that are different. So the first thing that's different is the openness and, uh, and that everything is based on open source uh, frameworks as opposed to platforms that create, that are highly opinionated and, uh, and are lock-in. So I think that's, that's a very, very fundamental difference. If you're looking at the initial kind of platform as a service approaches, they were, they were extremely opinionated and very rigid and not always open source or just a combination between open source and proprietary. So that's one very big difference. The second very big difference is the, the emphasis on, and it goes along with the first one, the emphasis on um, multi-cloud and infrastructure independence where a platform is not wedded to a particular stack where it's a AWS stack or a, uh, an Azure stack or a VMware stack. And, and, but it's truly a layer above that's completely open source centered. Yeah. And the third thing that is different is the idea that it's not just the software. The software alone will not do the job. You need the software and the content and the support and the expertise. If you're looking at how platform engineering is done at a large company like Apple, for example, or Facebook, it's really always the combination of those three things. It's the automation framework, the software, it's the content, the open source libraries or any other libraries that you create. And then it's the expertise that glues all this together and is being offered to developers to be able to take advantage of this like software factory. So I think these these are the major differences in terms of um, where we are today versus you know, five years ago, ten years ago. Thank you for unpacking that for me. I think that's great. Uh, great captures the the shift in value. This brings up my next um, uh, question for you because you know you take that to the next level. DevOps is now also graduating to a whole nother level. The future of DevOps. Uh, and software engineering more and more around Kubernetes and your tools like Lens and others uh, managing these deployments. What is the new role of DevOps? Obviously DevSecOps, but DevOps is now changing too. What's the future of DevOps in your opinion? Well, I believe that DevOps is going to become more and more integrated to where our ops is going to become uh, something like zero ops, where ops is going to be fully automated and something that's being delivered entirely through software and developers will be able to focus entirely just on, on creating and shipping code. I think that's the major, that's the major change that's happening. Um, a problem that's still yet I think to be solved like hundred percent correctly is the, the challenge of the last mile, like deploying that code on, on, on the infrastructure and making sure that it's performing correctly to the SLAs and optimizing everything. Um, I also believe that uh, the, uh, the the complexity, Kubernetes is very powerful, but at the same time, it offers a lot of room for complexity. There are many knobs and dials that you can turn in this microservices based architecture. And what we're discovering now is that this complexity kind of exceeds the ability of the individual developer or even a group of developers to constantly optimize things. So I believe what we will see is AI and machine learning taking charge of optimizing a lot of parameters, operating parameters uh, around the applications and that are deployed on Kubernetes to ensure those applications perform to the expectations of the owners. And that might mean performing to a very high standard of security, or it might mean performing to a very a low latency in certain geographies it might mean performing to um, a very low cost structure that you can expect and those things can change over time right yeah. so this challenge of operating an application in production on a Kubernetes substrate um, is I think a, a dramatically higher than on just additional cloud infrastructure or, or virtualization because you have so many services yeah interoperating with each other and so many different parameters you can set. I so that's the problem for machine learning and AI. I love the machine learning AI and I'd love to just get your thoughts on it because I love the zero ops um, narrative because that's day one, <laughs> zero ops. Now that you hear day two being discussed and people are also hyping up, you know, AI ops and other things, but you know, this notion of day two, okay, I'm shipping stuff in the cloud and I have to have zero ops 
on day two, three, four, et cetera. Uh, what's your take on that? Because that seems to be a hot air that customers uh, and enterprises are getting in and just understanding the new wave, riding it, and then going, wait a minute, I'm pushing new code that's breaking something over there I built months ago. So this, yeah. this notion of day two ops, they call it. But again, if you want to be zero ops, it's got to be every day. I think you hit the nail on the head. I don't think there's, a, there's going to be a difference between day one, day zero, day one, and day two. I think every day is going to be day zero. And the reason for that is because people will be shipping all the time. So your application will change all the time. So the application will always be fresh. So it'll always be day zero. So zero ops has to be there all the time, not just on the first day. It's a great slogan. Every day is day zero, which means it's going well. It means there's no, no problems. So I got to ask you the question, because one of the big things that's coming up as well is this idea of an SRE, not new to the DevOps world, but as enterprises start to get into an SRE role where with hybrid and now edge becoming you know, people and not just industrial, um, there's got a lot of activity going on on a distributed basis. So you're going to need to have this kind of notion of large scale and zero, zero ops, which essentially means automation, all those things you mentioned. Yeah. Not everyone can afford that. Um, not every company can afford to have, you know, hardcore DevOps groups to manage in their release process, all that stuff. So how are you helping customers and how do you see this problem being solved? Because this is the accelerant people want. They want the, the yeah. easy button, they want the zero ops, but they just, they don't, they can't pipeline people fast enough to, to do this role. Yeah. What you're describing is uh, the central differentiator we bring to customers. It's this idea of an as a service experience with guaranteed outcomes. So that's what makes us different versus the traditional enterprise infrastructure software model where people just consume software from vendors and system integrate themselves and then are in charge of operations themselves and carrying the technical risks themselves. We deliver everything as a service with guaranteed outcomes with a true cloud native experience. That means guaranteed SLAs, predictable outcomes, continuous updates, continuous upgrades, your on-prem infrastructure or your edge infrastructure is going to look and feel and behave exactly like a public cloud experience where you're not going to have to worry about SREs or the under maintaining the underlying infrastructure is being delivered to you as a service. That's a big part, that's a central part of what makes us different in this space. That's a great value proposition. Can you just expand, give an example of a use case where you guys are doing that? Because this is something that I'm seeing a lot of people looking to go faster. And you know, speed yeah. is good, but also could kill, right? So you could break things if you go yeah. too fast. Yeah, absolutely. I can give you several examples where we're doing this. Um, and we're very exciting company. So one company is booking.com. Booking.com has a massive on-prem infrastructure. They're also a massive public cloud consumer. And they decided they want to bring their internal infrastructure to um, to a cloud level of automation, cloud level of sophistication. In other words, they want to have their AWS on prem. They want it to be open source centric. And we're delivering this to them um, with very high end SLAs, exactly as a service turnkey, where there is nothing for them to system integrate or to tune and optimize and operate. It's being really operated 24 seven with guaranteed SLAs and outcomes by us through a combination of software and expertise that we have at massive scale and to, to the standards of booking.com. So this is one example. Another example, and this is a very large company, um, is at the opposite side of the spectrum. We have a customer called Netscope, super successful software as a service company in the security space um, growing in leaps and bounds with very high technical demands and security demands, and they want to have an on-prem cloud infrastructure to complement public clouds. Why? Because security is very important to them, latency is very important to them, control of the customer experience is very important to them, cost is very important to them. So for that reason, they, they want that in a network of data centers around the globe. And we provide that for them turnkey as a service 24-7 which enables them to focus 100% on building their own SaaS software, the functionality which matters to their customers and not have to worry about the underlying cloud infrastructure in the data centers. All of that gets provided to them as a guaranteed cloud experience to their end users. So this would be two examples yeah. of companies where we're doing this. It's a great service, people are looking for it. Great job. Adrian, great to see you. Thank you for coming on theCUBE here at DockerCon. 
2021. Um, take a minute to uh, put a plug in for the company. What are you guys up to? What are you looking for? Hiring, obviously you got great tracks with customers. Congratulations on Lens. Um, give a quick update on, on what's going on. Yeah, uh, happy, ha happy to give an update on the company. So here, here, here are the highlights that we're super excited about, about what we achieved last year and then what we're up to this year. So last year, what we're proud of is despite COVID, we haven't laid off a single person. We've kept all the staff and we've hired staff. We have um, gained 160 new customers, many of them some of the world's largest and best companies, and 300 of our existing customers have expanded their business with us uh, last year, which is fantastic. Uh, we also had a very strong financial result, we're cash flow positive. It, it was a tremendous, tremendous year for us. Uh, this year, it's very much a growth year for us and uh, with an incredible focus on customer outcomes and customer experience. So what we are really, really digging in super hard on is to give the customers the technology and the services that enable them to get to ship software faster and easier to dramatically increase the productivity of the software development efforts. Uh, on any cloud infrastructure, on-prem or public clouds using containers and, and, and Kubernetes, and to do that at scale. So we're extremely focused on custom outcomes, custom experience, and then the innovation that's required to make that happen. So you, you will continue to see a lot of innovation around Lens. So the last beta release of Lens that we brought out uh, has now a cloud service and a catalog feature where you can share all your cloud automations with your buddies in in um, in, uh, in your development team. So Lens used to be a single user product. Now it's a multi-user and, and team-based product, which is fantastic. Um, continues to grow very quickly. And then Container Cloud as a service, um, it's uh, it's still a very big bet that we're making on the infrastructure side. So well, you get that's what's happening at Kubernetes this year. Quite the open source cloud company, Adrian. Congratulations. We've been again following you've been on the many waves of innovation, open stack, large scale, open source software. Congratulations on your success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming on theCUBE. Yeah. Bye-bye. Okay, DockerCon 2021. This is CUBE coverage. I'm John Furrier here with Adrian INL, CEO, co-founder, and chairman of Marantis, sharing his perspective on the open source innovation with their products and also key trends in the industry that is changing the game and accelerating cloud value, cloud scale, cloud native applications. Thanks for watching. Thank you.